God is good all the time. And all the time. I apologize for the typo in the order of service there. I, I don't know why I didn't type in the service there through chapter 4. But see, that was a little cliffhanger. See, you weren't expecting that. And that's always good when you come to Scripture and you get something that you weren't expecting. Today's passage of Scripture, I think, is pretty timely because we kind of live in a day and age where people shy away from taking responsibility for their actions. We live in a day and age in a culture where people resist facing consequences. I want to act how I want to act, live how I want to live, and I don't want to have to face any consequences for my personal choices. We have people with disposable relationships. I mean, I just had someone unfriend me on Facebook last week. It was kind of tough. All right, it was, it was hard. But people unfriend us on Facebook, right? Uh, people abandon children that they don't want anymore. Uh, there are people with callous hearts. Promises that are broken, that becomes the norm. And we, we live in a culture where people don't have any problem taking care of number one. And James focuses on this. It's almost as if the Bible were written yesterday. Bruce was teasing with me this morning. He passed me a couple of books, and he held up the Bible. He goes, do you know this book? It's new. <laughs> But it's almost as if it's, although it's written thousands of years ago, it's like James was addressing our culture today. If you haven't opened your Bible or pulled up your Bible app on your phone or however you want to look at the Word of God, look at James chapter 3. Verse 16, he says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. It's almost as if James were looking into the future opened up a newspaper, and he says, oh, here's what 2014 will look like. And James focuses in this uh, brief paragraph and going into chapter 4, he focuses on the very common battle that all of us wrestle with. Selfishness. Each of us, from time to time, had a parent who tried to help us learn to share with other siblings or cousins or neighbors. Right? Uh, each of us, as we go into adulthood, have people who try to remind us that the universe doesn't what? It doesn't revolve around me? What? Oh, wow, that's a hard one to find out that the world and the universe don't revolve around us. And according to James, when selfishness rules, there can be no peace. We want to be peacemakers. We want to live a lifestyle of peace. We want to bring peace to the world around us. Our presence... Our influence should make a difference. And people should have a sense of wholeness and a sense of completeness, a sense of peace, a sense of settledness. Our lives should not cause chaos and destruction. When we come together and when we're in the lives of people, there should be something different. And why? Because our behavior counts. And that's what James is talking about here. Our behavior shows our true colors. You know the phrase true colors with a old-time naval battle would be taking place and the, the ship would sail up and they would have your country's flag hoisted up there and then right before like right before they shot at you when they got within firing distance they'd run their flag down and they would do what show their show their true colors and James says your behavior you may say one thing you may claim to believe another but your actions will always show what your true colors are and so, you know, if there's ever a confusion between what someone claims and what they say and what their actions show, guess what you can go with? Their, their actions. Look at James 3. Who is wise? Verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Hold on to that thought for a moment. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, his behavior, the way he acts, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. So he says, who is wise and understanding among you? That means you and I, all of us, we need to constantly be looking around for people in our lives that we can emulate, people that we can imitate, people that can mentor us. He says, who is wise and understanding? So basically, we need to look around us and say, okay, who is a person that I want to be more like when I grow up? Who is someone that I think my kids can look up to? What's the type of person I really want to be like? And so James is saying, by his good conduct, you know, his works will be shown in, in meekness of wisdom. But if there is something inside of me that's wrong, 
You know, if I have this bitterness, uh, this selfishness, this, this jealousy, don't boast and be false truth. And what's the truth that he's talking about? He's talking about the faith. Don't claim that you're a Christian. Don't claim to be faithful to God if this is the type of heart that you are developing. And so I need to be looking for people to imitate, people to follow, people to be shaped by. People just like the passage I've quoted to my children from the time that they could talk. 1 Corinthians 15.33, which says what, boys? Don't, don't let me down. Oh, look at that. Huh? Birds of a feather. Thank you. Jeremy, my adopted son as of last night. <laughs> he, birds of a feather. 1 Corinthians 15.33. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. We're going to be like the people that we hang around with. We're going to be shaped and influenced by those that we hang around with. So I need to be looking for people I want to be like. James says, if I claim to be one way, but really I'm a different way, I'm just an imposter. So what is bitter jealousy? That's an interesting way to phrase it. He says, if you have bitter jealousy, it's not just that I covet what you have, if I have bitter jealousy. Maybe you have a possession, or maybe uh, you have a relationship. Maybe there's something within your life that you have. It's not just that I covet it, but I'm upset with you because you have something that I don't have. I can't celebrate for you. Man, I'm so happy that you achieved that, that you received that, that you got there. And boy, I celebrate that with you. And one day, maybe you know I'll get there too. No, that's not what bitterness says. Bitterness says, I hate you for having that. That's not fair. Why should you have those blessings and not me? And so I'm angry with them for having what they have. And then I also enter into competition with them. James says that's not a healthy place to be, to be in competition with others. The funny thing is they don't even know. So what is the selfish ambition? We know bitter jealousy. What is selfish ambition? That's where I'm going to gouge and climb and step on and do whatever I have to do, no matter what the cost, to make sure that I succeed. I'm going to get to the top. I'm going to succeed. I'll use treachery. I'll use deceit. And I'll be consumed with victory no matter what. And James says, if that's what you're about, that's not godly at all. That is not a godly lifestyle. In fact, he says that's demonic. Verses 15 through 17. That's not from above. That, he will say, is demonic. Wisdom from above, though, the type that we want to have, that's pure. That's peaceable. That's gentle. Here's a tough one. Open to reason. In other words, I can listen to the other side. I, I can sit down and be open to having my mind changed. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's impartial and it's sincere. I don't know if you noticed in the paragraph, but the word wisdom is used at least four times. Now remember, when people were writing scripture, they didn't have a word processor. They didn't have... Um, control X, right? So they couldn't cut it out and they couldn't hit control uh, C and paste it somewhere else. There was no cut, there was no paste. They had what? Probably, in James's case, probably either papyrus or possibly even an animal skin. He doesn't have a lot of room. He doesn't get to go back and redo it very many times because it's a tedious process. He doesn't have an abundance of material. So any time an author of scripture uses a word that many times, that close together, that should catch our attention. I need to be a person of wisdom. And we already know that wisdom isn't just knowing the right answers. Wisdom isn't just knowing what the truth is. Wisdom is the ability to put into practice what is true. So when James goes to all that effort to use that word wise and to use that word wisdom, we need to be able to catch on to that. I said, that's got to make a difference in my life. I need to be a person who knows not just what the truth is, but a person who learns how to put it into practice. So bitterness, envy, jealousy, all this unhealthy stuff, what is the source of it? Which, by the way, those type of actions and attitudes and behaviors destroy community. So what is the source of that community-destroying attitude? According to James... It's our narcissistic tendency to be selfish. Look at chapter 4. 
So he finishes off chapter 3, and of course there's no chapter breaks when he writes it, but he finishes the thought there in verse 18, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, and look at the very next sentence, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? And you say, well, is he talking about just in a church setting? Is he talking about with people at work? Is he talking about people with my family? He's talking about all of our relationships. What is it that causes quarrels and fights among people? And what is it? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? I have this desire within inside of me. And I maybe know what's right from wrong. I maybe know what other people might find unfavorable. But this is warring with inside of me. And he says in verse 2, you desire and you do not have. So you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Oh, so, so I could just ask God and God is going to fix this. Well, James says, you do not have because you do not ask, but, verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? That idea of fighting, that enmity, that idea of strife, the idea of disconnected. So when I want to be comfortable within the world, when I want to be drawn to the world, when the ways of the world become more appealing to me than my spiritual growth, <coughs> than my spiritual foundation, than my relationships with people, than my ability to become more like God or to be closer to God, there's going to be problems. Because we live in two realms at once. Tammy and I went and saw Interstellar Thursday night. Loved it. Great movie. And so in Interstellar, the way that the theme is going to work... They're going to travel through a wormhole, all right? And they're going to come out into a different galaxy. And so, of course, the idea is that you could be in different places at once, right? And um, you could travel back and forth in time and all that great science fiction stuff. The reality is, for us, not science fiction at all, we live in two realms at once. I live in the world right now that has what? I, I can touch it. I can feel it. I can smell it. I can taste it like the burnt biscuits we had this morning. Right? Uh, Adrian's not. Yeah, they were burnt. Okay. I complained. I voiced a complaint. Uh, so you can smell, you can taste, you can hear. Right? We can use all our five senses. I don't know if I covered them all or not. But we live in a realm of the five senses. But I also live in a realm, a spiritual realm, a supernatural realm that I can't see. According to the Apostle Paul, that there are angels and there are demons. We can't see them. There are principles, uh, dark forces that are battling against us. Scripture is filled with the idea that I live in two realms at once. I may be acting and breathing and fulfilling things within the material universe, but I also occupy a space in the heart of God, in the mind of God, that is based in spiritual realities. And so if I'm drawn more to one than the other, there's going to be strife. And James is going to say, I cannot be drawn to this world and grow in this world and still love and grow in my relationship with God. And that's hard. Paul offers a good perspective on this battle. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We brought nothing into this world. Guess what? We take nothing out of this world. He says, but if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. It, isn't it amazing how satisfying it is to enjoy good health? Spend time with family. Uh, to come in from doing yard work or a bike ride or whatever and just a cold glass of water. I mean, does that not just satisfy? Paul says, look, if you've got food and clothing, that is reason right there to be content. And you and I know that we live in a world where thousands of people die every day. Why? They don't have clean water. They don't have running water. They don't have electricity. They can't go to a faucet and turn it on. They don't have a refrigerator. They don't even have Tupperware. Paul says, <laughs> hey, think about that, man. Paul says, look, if we have food and clothing, that's reason for contentment. The reality of it is, I live in two different realms, but one realm that I live in is eternal, and what is the other one? It's temporary. I hate to say it, guys, but this world is temporary. Don't let it take center stage. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, don't take any wooden nickels. No, that's not what he says. But he does say, don't let the world dictate your character. 
Jesus tells his disciples, Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. So self-gratification gets put off to the side. I learned to say no to myself. I'm, I'm saying yes to the world. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That doesn't mean, oh, I have a bad hip. That's my cross to bear. Or countless mother-in-law jokes that we could tell, right? That's not, that's not the cross to bear. It means dying to self. Saying no to self. And saying yes to God. So deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And what will a man profit if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And James says, you've got this quarreling and this fighting because there's things that you want, you don't have it. And when you do have it, you want to spend it wrongly. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity of God? But he goes on to say, James will say in chapter 4, verse 5, Do you suppose it's to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? God created us in his image. And when we become believers, the Holy Spirit indwells us. God wants us more than we want anything else. No matter what it is that you want. You want to win the lottery. You want to drive a Bentley. I don't know what it is in the world that you want. You want to have a perfect work environment. I don't know what it is that, that you crave within this world. Whatever it is, no matter how bad you want it, you want it so bad you can taste it, God says, I want you even more. I yearn. I long. I desire to be connected with you. So we know the problem, right? Selfishness. Anybody in here never struggle with selfishness? I mean, we, all, we go through, Jeremy, thank you for being honest. Right? So we go through cycles, don't we? We go through cycles where sometimes I get a little bit more mature and then sometimes I, I, I drift off. But I go through cycles. We go through cycles. We wrestle with it. We know what the problem is. Uh, so what's the solution? What is the solution that James will offer me to avoid destroying myself and destroying the community around me? Pretty simple. And for James, I think, I, I hope I'm, I'm hitting this correctly, it's realizing that meekness is not weakness. We think a meek person is a doormat. We think meekness is not a trait to, to aspire to. I think what James is saying is I, I need to have meekness. Because when I have that sense of humility, then it doesn't all become about me. Verse 6, very quickly, James 4, verse 6. God gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. And I know this is a very simple passage to hear, but I think we've got to peel back just one or two layers. Submit yourself to God, therefore. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the devil's the bad influence. He wants to be drawn close to the world. He wants to be selfish. And so the simplicity is I submit to God. That's where it sounds simple. But if I'm still self-centered, if I'm still selfish, if it's still all about me, guess who I will only submit to? Me. Because when it's full of selfishness, then who's the smartest one? Me. Who's going to look out for me? Me. But once I become meek and I become humble, it's then that I can submit to God, which means I'm going to obey Him. I'm going to learn what He has to say. I'm going to willingly follow Him. That's why it's so important to not be wrapped up with selfishness because that makes it hard to submit to God. So I realize meekness isn't weakness. I'm going to submit to God. And then as I draw near to God and I resist the devil, then that devil backs off because I'm closer to God. Does that mean I'll never be afflicted? Does that mean I'll never struggle with temptation? No, that's not what James is saying. So I'm driven more by that other realm. The spiritual, the eternal, the one that God dwells in that calls me to come to him. And one of those keys to being able to resist the selfishness, one of those keys to be able to increase my meekness and humility, one of those keys to being able to admit, uh, admit, submit and obey God more is a word that we don't use very much in our culture. Because it's a word that means I have to admit I've made mistakes. It's a word that means I haven't always been right, that I didn't know all the answers. 
And lastly, it's a word that means I have to make some changes. It begins with an R. Does anyone want to take a stab at it? Repentance. That's what James lays out here. He's shown the problem, the selfishness. He's shown how destructive it is. He shows how murderous we can become. He shows how distant we can become from God. He begins to give the solution. And then he says in verse 8, draw near to God. I love this. Because this really wasn't sounding like good news. You're murderous. You're adulterous people. You're hateful. You're slanderous. You're stabbing each other in the back. All this ugly stuff doesn't sound like good news, but, but there is good news in this passage. Because the promise is, even for these sinful believers who have kind of not been imitating God very well, draw near to God, verse 8 says, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. He's talking about repentance here. Let your laughter be turned into mourning. Does that mean God doesn't want us to be joyous? No. What are they laughing about? The fact that they've been stabbing each other in the back and climbing their way to the top. Let that laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. And the good news is, I'm going to draw near to God. He is going to reciprocate. And he's going to draw near to me. And he's going to cleanse me. And He's going to change me. And then I sit there and I go, yeah, and I know a lot of people that need to hear that message. And James says, oh, well, if you think of the price of someone else, verse 11, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer, but a judge. And guess what? Verse 12 says, by the way, there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you? to destroy. So sure, we all struggle with selfishness. We all struggle with these issues. We all struggle with times when we want to say, oh, someone else needs to hear that. So may we find peace through this passage. May we find peace by drawing closer to each other, by, by looking to the needs of others, and by walking humbly with our Lord.